This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The first lecture, The Block Equations and Image Contrast, is broken down into four parts. Lecture 1A covers the main B0 field and the equation of motion. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to list six principal requirements for MRI, explain the principal function of the main B0 field, appreciate that B0 is a superconducting electromagnet, describe the magnitude, spatial, and temporal characteristics of B0, define B0 with a mathematical expression, and to relate spin, mass, and charge to the equation of motion, and finally to connect the equation of motion to the well-known Larmor equation. First, we begin by describing the requirements for MRI. First uh, requirement is an NMR active nucleus, which includes perhaps the hydrogen bound to water. We also need the main magnetic or the B0 field, which serves to polarize the spin system and make it available for detection. An RF system or B1 exciter system is also required to tip the magnetization away from its equilibrium position. We also need gradients, the so-called GX, GY, and GZ gradients, whose principal function is spatial encoding. And finally, we need coils or receivers that are available for detecting the so-called transverse magnetization according to Faraday's law of induction. And needless to say, there's several computers involved that are required for reconstructing and storing the data. It's important when thinking about MR signals uh, to think about where we get signals from and also where we don't get signals from. And so importantly, we do get signal from things like soft tissues. This includes muscles, organs, fat, etc., and also fluids like cerebrospinal fluid, blood, and synovial fluids. But we also don't get signal from very specific areas of the body, including hard tissues like cortical bone, ligament, tendon, and teeth, nor do we get signal in gas spaces like the lung air space, the sinuses, and the bowel. Now, principal to, uh, or fundamental to all of MRI is a so-called NMR active nucleus. And in this case, we're interested in the hydrogen nucleus, which is comprised of a proton and an electron. And while we're generally familiar with the concepts of charge, such as the positively charged proton and the mass, the proton itself has mass, it's not always as well appreciated that there's also an intrinsic property called spin. And the combination of these three inherent intrinsic properties, spin, charge, and mass, fundamentally underlie the NMR phenomena. Here we see a table of different NMR active nuclei, and while it's not important to memorize a table such as this, it is important to recognize that there are several nuclei that are available for NMR detection, and that includes any isotope shown here whose spin is non-zero, so you have to have a, a non-zero spin. Hydrogen itself has, uh, is a spin half nucleus, and it's in high natural abundance. Most of the hydrogen in the universe is H1 as opposed to H2, which is also uh, exhibits spin, but has a much lower natural abundance. One key feature of each of these NMR active nuclei is the so-called gyromagnetic ratio, which is unique to each species. And because we're uh, so focused on uh, the utility of hydrogen, uh, or H1 in particular, for imaging, it's good to remember the gyromagnetic ratio for H1, which is 42.57 megahertz per, uh, per Tesla. And because of its uh, high natural abundance, it has both high relative sensitivity, by definition, uh, all things are taken relative to H1, and it has high absolute sensitivity because of its natural abundance. So we can look through this table and see, for example, that imaging can be done with 31 phosphorus, a spin half uh, uh, system. Uh, it has a lower gyromagnetic ratio, but it also has quite low absolute sensitivity, making detection of 31P more challenging than that of hydrogen or some other species. When it comes to nuclear precession, this is a nice uh, image uh, provided by Don Plues at University of Toronto. We can zoom in to a water molecule here, which is comprised of two hydrogens and an oxygen. And if we look inside this uh, hydrogen nucleus itself, we remember, as we saw in the previous slide, that of course it's positively charged. And in combination to having charge, it has the inherent nuclear property of spin. And that combination of charge and spin gives rise to a magnetic moment, meaning that the hydrogen nucleus itself behaves like a tiny magnetic dipole. And when placed into an external B0 field, it comes into an alignment. Now, in addition to spin and charge, we're familiar with the hydrogen nucleus also having spin and mass. 
And as a consequence of spin and mass, you have so-called angular momentum. Uh, if taken as an example, a top itself will precess in a gravitational field. A hydrogen nucleus will also precess, but in the presence of a different potential field, and that is a B0 field. And so here we can see that the combination of spin charge and mass give rise to a magnetic moment and angular momentum. And in the presence of B0 field, the hydrogen nucleus is inherently precessing. Uh, at a, at a particular frequency called the Larmor frequency. And so this equation here describes that the processional frequency omega is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio, which we found in the table a couple slides ago, and the externally applied B0 field. Now in this lecture, we'll develop uh, the mathematics behind where this Larmor uh, equation actually comes from. And that's a consequence of the so-called equation of motion. So let's talk a little bit about the gyromagnetic ratio. It has units, of course, sometimes stated in radians per second per Tesla, perhaps more intuitively in terms of megahertz per Tesla. It's a physical constant that's unique for each NMR active nuclei. And it represents the ratio of the magnetic moment to the spin angular momentum. And this expression is derived uh, empirically, and it's available and useful for us when we look at the equation of motion or drive the equation of motion uh, in the next few slides. It governs the frequency of precession, as we'll see. Uh, and it's important to remember that uh, we sometimes work in radians, we sometimes work in hertz. And so there's the definitions of both gamma uh, and gamma bar. Uh, and it's uh, important or good to be mindful of whether we need to be using gamma or gamma bar, uh, just so that our calculations work out correctly. So let's talk some about the main B0 field. Here's a hardware diagram uh, that I pulled from the internet, and it uh, sort of diagrams uh, the, the various important hardware components for a simple MRI system. And what we're focused on right now is the main B0 field. This is the electromagnetic windings uh, shown here in green, and they reside inside the cryostat, which is uh, liquid helium cooled uh, to keep things at superconducting temperatures. And as the lectures develop, we'll also talk about the, the body coil, which is the B1 coil used for exciting the spins, and then the X and Y and Z gradients, which are important for spatial localization. So the B0, or the main field, has several important characteristics. Uh, firstly, it's a very strong magnetic field. This is a 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla uh, field strength uh, for most clinical imaging systems. It is inherently a superconducting electromagnet. And in reference to the Earth's field, which is about half a Gauss, or a refrigerator magnet, which is about 100 Gauss, uh, we see that this is a, an extremely strong electromagnetic field. It is a spatially uniform uh, magnetic field. It varies by only about one part per million uh, in terms of the RMS over a volume of a 50 centimeter uh, diameter sphere. Uh, and so this is an engineering standard that's used to describe the uniformity of the main field. It's also quite temporally stable, which is to say that the B0 field really decays very little as a function of time, perhaps one part per million uh, per hour. And it's oriented along the z-axis or the k-axis. And the z-axis is, if you think of a conventional MRI scanner, it's the long axis of the scanner and generally the uh, axis along which the patient's head and foot is oriented. So mathematically, we could write down a very simple expression, and we'll use this a lot uh, to describe the external B0 field, uh, to say that it's B0 in magnitude oriented along the k-hat direction. And note that this is explicitly not a function of space nor time. So let's think of some principles of the main B0 field. B0 is a strong magnetic field and it importantly serves to polarize the spin system or the uh, hydrogen nuclei that are uh, being used in the imaging experiment, whether that's water in a human subject or uh, perhaps some other uh, sample. And so here we can see a subject that we won't spend a lot of time on in this course, but there is the concept of the spins either pointing up or down in low and high energy states. Uh, that gives rise to uh, a net polarization that's available for detection. We also know that B0 generates so-called bulk magnetization, and we'll develop this concept uh, shortly a little bit more. But the more B0 we have, the more bulk magnetization we have. And that fundamentally underlies the drive for people to explore higher and higher field systems, uh, 7T systems, 9.4T systems, etc. And the basic concept is simply that there are lots, you know, Avogadro's numbers, billions and billions of magnetic dipoles in small volumes of tissue. And we can add up the ensemble behavior of all of those magnetic dipoles and refer to it simply as the bulk magnetization.
Uh, as we saw previously, B0 forces the bulk magnetization to process, and this gives rise to the so-called Larmor equation, a concept that we're just going to develop now. And so we have the Larmor expression relating the frequency of precession to the gyromagnetic ratio in the externally applied B0 field. But in fact, it could be any B field, a combination of the B0 field and, for example, the B1 field, which we'll see is used for exciting, or the gradient fields used for spatial localization. The main B0 field, uh, when it's delivered, is quite homogeneous, but it's not perfect, and it can uh, become less homogeneous as a function of time, uh, just as the system uh, environment perhaps changes, and also when subjects or objects are added to the scan environment. So here we'll just discuss briefly the concepts of passive and active shimming. This is a bare magnet. It's been stripped down of the shroud that's usually in place for, say, a clinical imaging system. And inside here, we can see a, a ring of hardware that includes the gradient hardware, some cooling hardware. But each of these sleeves here contains a, a long uh, deck of, of what are called passive shim trays. And so we can pull one of these decks out and then we can see uh, an empty uh, deck. So no shim cards placed here, a large shim card, a small shim card. And then this is the deck when it's been sealed with a cap on top. And the point is that uh, magnetic field probes can be used to measure the homogeneity of the magnetic field. And these shim cards can be used to adjust, kind of push and pull, if you will, the magnetic field to improve its overall homogeneity. And this is done uh, in an iterative process by an engineer uh, who adjusts uh, the, the shims in each of the shim decks uh, and then subsequently measures the field until it meets the engineering specification we suggested earlier of being you know, a few parts per million over some uh, sphere of interest. And so that helps ensure the magnetic field homogeneity of the system. Uh, once the system has been installed, it's also possible to perform so-called active shimming to help smooth uh, out the B field along, for example, the Z direction. So here we show just a Maxwell uh, paracoil, coil winding, say, at the head and foot of the scanner. And by adjusting small amounts of current, we can steer uh, the magnetic field uh, linearity to uh, perhaps improve the overall field uh, of homogeneity. So let's just look at one simple example of how the main B0 field is generated. Uh, fundamentally, it has a solenoidal uh, geometry, so it's a simple winding of superconducting wire. And in the simplest case, the B field that's generated is equal to uh, the permeability. In this case, we just think of air vacuum space, the internal uh, aspect of the coil uh, winding itself. And it's governed largely by uh, the current, which is uh, uh, put into the system, the number of coil windings, and then the overall length of the system. Now this is kind of an interesting example. Here's a main magnetic field for the sh when the shroud was pulled off and we can see conveniently that the engineer wrote the current on the side of the magnet here as being 508 amps. So we use this as an example just to help uh, understand A, you know, the magnitude of the currents involved in these kinds of systems. And then we can make some simple calculations in this example with MATLAB to demonstrate that we need about 2350 uh, coil windings for a, a magnet that's about a meter long to generate a 1.5 Tesla scanner. So here the main point is to appreciate A, that it's a solenoidal geometry and that the currents required are quite high. Okay, so we've been leading up to where is it that the Larmor equation actually comes from. So we remember from earlier in this lecture that uh, the, mag the hydrogen nuclei, rather, have both magnetic moments and spin angular momentum. And the magnetic moment arises as a consequence of spin and charge, meaning it behaves like a small magnet. And the angular momentum arises as a consequence of both spin and mass. And we have this empirical finding that related these two measures, uh, the magnetic moment being equal to the gyromagnetic ratio times the spin angular momentum. We also remember from basic physics or electromagnetism that a magnetic dipole or magnetic uh, moment placed inside an externally applied B field will have a torque exerted on it. So this is the torque on the magnetic moment when it's in a B field. And these two relations will come together to help us understand the so-called equation of motion. So if we take the time derivative, uh, uh, sorry, we can relate the definition of torque to the time derivative of the spin angular momentum. And then if we take the time derivative of this empirical finding, uh, we can find a, a relationship that also stands in relation to the uh, time rate of change of the spin angular momentum. 
we can substitute this definition of the torque into this uh, expression here for the torque exerted on a magnetic dipole. And now we can see how this empirical finding on the left-hand side relates to how we understand uh, magnetic moments and torques to relate inside an externally applied B field. And by equivalence, we can find that the time rate of change of the uh, magnetic moments uh, uh, dynamics is equal to the cross product of the magnetic dipole itself times uh, gamma in the externally applied B field. And so this is a derivation of the equation of motion for an individual magnetic dipole. And it describes to us a system of equations uh, that explain the dynamics of the magnetic dipole in an externally applied B field. And in fact, the solution to the set of differential equations will make more apparent um, the Larmor expression, which is where we're leading with this. Now we said before uh, that it's, it's perhaps more relevant to think about the bulk magnetization rather than individual magnetic dipoles. And remember that the, the bulk magnetization itself is just the ensemble behavior, the sum of, um, you know, say millions and billions of little magnetic dipoles. And so for the rest of these lectures, we'll think just intrinsically in terms of bulk magnetization being representative of the behavior of, you know, millions or billions of magnetic dipoles. And so by substitution, we can find an equation of motion for the so-called bulk magnetization. And this derivation follows a classical description. There's more sophisticated quantum descriptions of this phenomena, but this expression here becomes exceedingly useful for explaining a lot of NMR phenomena, uh, especially those that relate to magnetic resonance imaging and ones we'll develop further in this class. So uh, given a system of differential equations like this, what's the general solution? So the first thing we want to do is remember that the B field we care about is just B0 uh, along the K direction itself. And so we can expand the cross product shown on the previous term uh, into a determinant. Uh, and so we have the individual components of the bulk magnetization. And then the only externally applied B field that we have is on the K uh, direction. And so we have 0 on X, 0 on Y, and gamma B0 uh, on the K direction. And this represents, again, a system of coupled order, ordinary differential equations. We can write these out as individual uh, expressions. So now we're just expanding the cross product term to show that we have three different differential equations. And you can see that they're coupled because the MX component, uh, the time derivative of the MX component depends on the MY component, and the time derivative of the MY component depends on the MX component. The MZ component under these conditions is independent. So the general solution, and I won't go through uh, the, the origins of the general solutions for differential equations. You can find that material in, in uh, other uh, resources. But the, the most general solution uh, follows, and it says that the uh, temporal behavior, or mx as a function of time, depends on the initial condition uh, along the x direction uh, and a cosine function, and the initial condition along the y direction and a sine function. And we can see with this that it looks similar for the MY component and, of course, looks quite different for the MZ component. The MZ component suggests that MZ as a function of time just depends on whatever the initial condition was. And if you have some background in MR already, you'll recognize uh, that at this point we're not including the concepts of relaxation. That's something that we'll develop later. So uh, with regards to nomenclature, when we denote M uh, sub X super uh, zero or super naught, uh, these represent the initial condition uh, at, say, time zero for each of these magnetization components. Uh, this behavior can actually be written in matrix form, and that might be more intuitive for those with a background in uh, matrix algebra or linear algebra. And so we can write the bulk magnetization as a function of time as a rotation operator, which fundamentally rotates around the z-axis. It depends on omega zero, and we'll see where that comes from in a second, times time. And that rotation operator acts on the initial state of the bulk magnetization to generate a new state of the bulk magnetization. And so we call this a free precession operator. This is something that'll get developed further in some of the later lectures when we talk about how to simulate spin systems. But this free precession operator can be expanded uh, just as a, as a um, matrix uh, of sine and cosine functions, where it perhaps becomes more apparent that this represents a rotation of the bulk magnetization about, in this case, the z uh, direction. Uh, and importantly, this is a left-hand uh, rotation. So a function that, that, that drops out of the solution to those differential equations shows that this is a left-hand rotation when the gyromagnetic ratio is positive. Uh, and finally, we can see that this omega zero term uh, that we introduced here is just equal to gamma B zero. And so it's 
really by equivalence that we arrive at the Larmor equation uh, as being uh, dropping out, if you will, from the solution to the equation of motion for the bulk magnetization. So this gives us some insight uh, or direct insight to the origins of the Larmor equation itself. And this, of course, represents just the initial condition. So uh, you might ask yourself, uh, now that we understand that the bulk magnetization will uh, process, how do we generate detectable signals? And for that answer, we'll have to come back for the next lecture. So please click the links below for the next lecture.